Okay. Get ready. This is going to uh, knock your socks off and more. If you go to geoengineeringwatch.org, Dane Wigington's magnificent site, there's a new feature up there. We're, we're going to ask you to go to guests at rents.com and uh, click on the link below Dane Wigington. And that'll pull up a special page that we've been able to put together for you tonight. Uh, we've enlarged some of these satellite pictures. We're going to get to them all in a few minutes. But let me welcome Dane back. And again, Dane's a, a, a friend, a colleague, a neighbor. He's just down the road a ways. And I've never met anyone more ferociously dedicated to the truth of what's being done to our planet. What's being done in the skies of our planet, in the atmosphere, is beyond an international war crime. It's beyond, it's suicidal. This is an extinction level event that's going on here. And Dane's been talking about it for, for quite a number of years now. Um, we have a lot of news to talk about, but let me just mention that geoengineeringwatch.org has 32 million views. 32 million. You'll say to yourself, wow, one of the most important websites. Yes. And we're going to find out some very unpleasant news about uh, Google once again uh, right now before we jump into the uh, satellite pictures. Hi, Dane. Welcome back. Thanks for making yourself available tonight. Thanks for having me back, Jeff. And thanks for your relentless effort to help me cover this greatest and most immediate threat we face short of nuclear cataclysm, climate engineering, which is even directly connected to the threat we face from from nuclear meltdowns, as, yes, as I yes. know you talk about a lot, climate engineering, uh, we can elaborate on that later, but virtually from every direction, climate engineering, pulling the noose around our collective necks. And uh, we are rapidly running out of time. In fact, it, it may be too late. I don't know. But uh, 32 million views, Dane. What happened with Google? Well, because of our site traffic, if under the search term geoengineering, under that term, yeah. We, our rankings would put us and did put us at the top of the first page of a Google search of the geoengineering term. About eight weeks ago, we disappeared. We were erased from the search of that term from 19 total pages. In the first two or <laughs> three days, they kicked us back to the seventh or eighth page. And a few days later, they completely deleted our home page from a search of that term. Now, if, if you search other search engines, all of them based on rankings, DuckDuckGo or Bing, we are the top of the first page. We take up about a half a page, again, with because of the, right. the size of our site and the amount of views. Yeah. But yes, Google has completely deleted us. I don't know how all of you feel about that, but uh, it makes me uh, cringe to think that uh, the people that run Google would be so afraid of the truth that they would have to stoop to this kind of censorship, which is what it is. What they didn't want people to see is that when they search the geoengineering term, as people are now doing around the globe, because this elephant in the sky is becoming all but impossible to hide, what they found when we were on the page we were supposed to be on is below our website link is title for what our site is about, exposing the global climate engineering cover-up. That's right. not what Google wants people to see, clearly. Google is not your friend, all right? That's the bottom line. Google is not our friend co in a collective sense. Google is running an agenda, as are most of the primary components of what we call the Internet. And they're all, they're all working the same basic side of the road, all right? Just, just keep that in mind. 32 million views, and they do not exist any longer, according to Google. There you go. All right, what we're going to do this hour is look at some things that, when I saw them, I, I called Dane almost immediately. I said, my God, <laughs> what, what more will it take? This is, this is, these pictures are, are staggering. Uh, the story, NASA satellite imagery reveals shocking proof of climate engineering. Absolute, utter shocking proof. Uh, Dane writes, in regard to difficult to accept, and unpleasant truths, a picture is worth a thousand words. The photo images shown below were captured from NASA satellite sources. They are truly alarming. These images provide shocking and undeniable proof of the ongoing global climate engineering 
geoengineering, solar radiation management assault on our planet and its life support systems. Highly toxic heavy metals and chemicals that are system systemically and systematically sprayed into our atmosphere from jet aircraft as part of the geoengineering solar radiation management programs are manipulated with extremely powerful radio frequency RF signals. These signals are transmitted from countless locations around the globe from various types of transmission platforms. Ionospheric heating platform installations like HARP, SBX radar, NEXRAD, and so forth. The impact of the microwave transmissions on cloud formations is profound and highly visible as we are all just about to see. When did you come across these? I, you've always had great pictures, but this is a treasure trove. Well, it takes some time in looking to produce those. It's like some of the images we produce, uh, Jeff, that uh, we have to stay up to the wee hours of the of the oh, yeah. night. And, yeah. and when, for example, when the hurricanes are making landfall and we are in the process of recording animations of the radio frequency microwave transmissions that are being used to manipulate cyclones doing devastating damage to the U.S., um, we have to compile dozens of individual short animations and to produce our own uh, full length version, if you will, and it just it just takes time. Every few hours, they update. We have to be there. We have to be ready. We have to record them. You can't get them otherwise. So, um, just that type of tedious process. Right. All right. Uh, the link under Dane's name, uh, mind boggling, and it really is a mind boggle. NASA satellite photos, absolutely proving massive global weather control. Pull that page up. Please, courtesy of Dane Wigington and geoengineeringwatch.org, uh, we're posting these in a larger format because I wanted you to be able to see more intricate detail of the most unnatural sky phenomena you'll ever see. This is crazy. Let's start, uh, Dane. Yeah, you got your uh, monitor there, right? As I'm pulling it up now, what you have. I'm, okay, I'm, yeah. I've had a little bit of a power issues this year we've never had because we just are now getting rain of course but uh, prior to uh, not very many days ago uh -huh. this has been the most difficult year yet to produce power in my location i'm completely off grid i have a very large solar system uh -huh. i have three wind turbines and i have a hydro system so wind solar or hydro and in the past we have always been able to produce enough from what you need systems. to get by no yeah no longer. How many days, Jeff, do we have now where if we have featureless skies, it's dry, there's no wind, the ridiculously resilient ridge of high pressure, ionosphere heater induced ridge of high pressure is parked over us. So yeah. we can't produce any form of renewable energy. I hope you can't hear my generator going in the background, but um, I've, I've had to generate power to keep my battery bank charged this year. And, and again, wow. this is uh, just, just one indication of the profound effect that climate mm -hmm. engineering mm -hmm. has on the overall biosphere, if you will. How many batteries do you have in your bank, round numbers, that you keep um, charged? Well, people might not understand in, in terms of amp hour ratings, but I have um, equivalent, let me break this down into generation terms. It would be the equivalent of running a 7,000 watt generator uh, for about, um, gosh, a couple of days. Huh. You know, so it's it's a lot of power. I'm trying to break that down where people understand that because they won't understand amp hour. So it's, I, I, let me put it into pounds. I have about... Um, 24,000 pounds of batteries. So oh my. In, in uh again with renewable energy and although yeah. I it's better than the grid certainly but it's important for people to understand on that note too that renewable energy is not what it's sold as it's a, it's an energy extender it's better than fossil fuels no question and that being my background again i i'm not trying to uh undermine it but i'm saying that when people think jeff mm -hmm. that we can just burn up all the fossil fuel and then switch to renewables no that's not the case that is not no. the case it takes right. a tremendous amount of fossil fuel to produce a 450 foot tall wind turbine and to and to produce the power yeah, lines to go with point. that and so you bet. So people just need to, if they think that we can paint ourselves into an unbelievably dark corner, burn up all the fossil fuels, put it in the atmosphere, and then magically switch to renewables, not going to happen. No. All right. Let's look at these pictures. And again, I, I want to thank Dane publicly for letting me blow these up. Uh, and he's, they're, they're fully linked right back to geoengineeringwatch.org. It's right there. First picture is off the east coast of Australia. 
all right? That's the East Coast, not the West. That would be, so to speak, our side of Australia. Now, look at this satellite picture. Look at the clouds. What do you see? What do you see? Does this look in any possible way natural? No. This is nuts. This is absolute craziness that you're seeing there. This is... uh it's got to be more than just harp. I don't know what it is, Dane, but but you would know better than anyone. This is this is the most ugly thing, the most unnatural looking cloud system that I I can even imagine. And wait till you see what's coming up. Don't don't look ahead, everyone. Stay with us. We're gonna let's go through this together. That's astounding. This particular, this particular image is very important because it completely refutes what the paid liars at the Weather Channel would try to have us believe now when you see these types of these types of herringbone patterns what they would they initially have tried the gravity wave uh, hypothesis which if you know enough about that it's 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 profoundly ridiculous and they try to claim that this is caused from a topographical feature below the clouds oh please so, so this is the weather the, channel doing this it's a, uh, the weather channel's job is to explain a way the completely engineered and unnatural yeah. is natural. Anybody who watches the Weather Channel that knows anything about what's happening with climate engineering and the implosion of the biosphere, it's it's to the point now of, of being completely absurd, these paid actors and really paid liars. And and what they try to explain away as to why the uh, there's so many ice storms now. Why it's uh -huh. snowing at 40, snowing at 45 degrees. Uh, you know the, the 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 trail of deception there goes on and on. But with the this particular photo that we're looking at right now, right. and the overlapping herringbone patterns indicates an overlapping of transmissions from multiple locations that are all interacting in that site. And and this is again it completely refutes any of the official narratives I, I it's mean, embarrassing that, just embarrassing it, looks like they've been just poured there and piled up on top of each other are these pulsed uh emf things that cause the herringbone or is it more of a, a term a longer term uh energy transmission looks to me like well, again, it's it might be pulsed boom and they've done it and it the clouds are shaped in this absurd unnatural configuration and they just sort of float around and move around in their bowl now there's aspects of the transmission procedures that we are still trying to unravel but the bottom line is people understand if you put electrically conductive particulates and when you we saturate the air mass with those particulates if you can move those particulates you can move the air mass so if you put uh -huh. iron shavings for example on a on a table and you put a magnet underneath what happens they align in certain configurations yeah so when we when we radio we see the radio frequency transmissions showing up in the cloud masses that are saturated with these electrically conductive particulates. It's indicative of those frequencies interacting with those particulates, and that's again how they move the air masses around. They're 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 saturating the particulates. In the case of the hurricanes, that they can somehow magically predict a week ahead of time that will make unprecedented in the case of hurricane sandy yeah. an unprecedented 90 degree westerly turn right where they said it would turn and when we see then as those storms are coming ashore and the ground based radio frequency transmitters light up and energize as a repelling effect on those uh -huh. storms so they can uh -huh. they can lock those storms in place and what we see in the animations we record is as they want those storms to start migrating inland you'll see the transmitters de-energize and that reduces the repelling factor and the storms can then migrate in different directions and then they'll light the transmitters up on the back side of those storms to push them or propel them in that direction does that make I sense see. Should do it. yeah 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 uh and for the, people these... who want to see this if, if they search uh, to find our in information on our site, if you search because it's becoming hard because of what Google's doing, but if you search geoengineeringwatch.org, put the full website aim and then search engineering hurricanes, geoengineeringwatch.org, engineering droughts, geoengineeringwatch.org, engineering winter, mm -hmm. uh, so on, wildfires. Mm -hmm. Easier to find our data in the toolbar at the top too. We have our categories: engineering winter, engineering fires, engineering drought, so forth. What a, what a, what a resource. No wonder they wanted to hide it. Just incredible. So what we're seeing here in the herringbone patterns uh, is a reaction between the, uh, the EMF being pumped up uh, and the, the metallic particulates that are being sprayed into the clouds and into the upper atmosphere moisture. Correct. Exactly correct. Just amazing. 
All right, let's go down to the second picture, the next one. This is an odd one. West coast of Africa. That's a weird looking formation. You think that looks natural? Come on, be serious. No one watching this can say that that's a natural cloud formation. Look at the right angles in there, for God's sakes. 90 degree right angles. Doesn't happen. Does not happen. Tell us that more about this shot. one. Yeah. Now, that's an important location because um, that off of that section of coastline is where many of the Atlantic cyclones are spawned. And they can make or break them immediately in, in that particular geographic location. So what we see is... Many of the cyclones are weakened. You mean hurricanes. That's what he's talking about, hurricanes. That's correct. I'm sorry. Yeah. Cyclone and right. hurricane, same, same animal, different name. So we see the cyclones being weakened as they cross the Atlantic, which makes them much easier to steer. And, and uh -huh. Jeff, you've heard this term from many mm -hmm. of the, the uh, official weather disseminating agencies, all of which are owned by power structure entities. But you've heard the term rapid intensification a lot lately, yep. correct? Yep, yep. So – what they do, the, the cyclones, again, they don't allow them to spin up to full strength as they're crossing the Atlantic. That makes them harder to steer. And again, for those that wonder how they can steer a hurricane, there's a number of methods when they, they can weaken them with moisture-absorbing aerosols to diminish some of the convection. With ionosphere heaters, ground-based large radio frequency transmitters, I know you know what those are, Jeff, but you're, for your listeners, they can create various pressure zones atmospherically, which helps to draw the storm in a certain direction. But once the storm is nearer where they want it to be, then we hear the term rapid intensification. At minimum, they are allowing it to spin up to full strength. At maximum, they are augmenting that streak. So in case of Hurricane Harvey, for example, uh -huh. you know, we see that steered into its location. They somehow knew days ahead of time it was going to park itself there <laughs> for days. And, and we have the animations. If you should yeah. steering watch that Hurricane Harvey, we have profound animations of the the – transmissions holding that storm in place absolutely inarguable please go look and uh i, I did uh, that one storm uh, that was supposed to hit oahu in hawaii i don't know if you've seen that or not i was able to find the actual picture where they brought the uh the hurricane to a complete stop and then stomped it with emf and it just was literally flattened like a pancake with radiating arms of uh, moisture extending out and almost 360 degrees around from the core of the hurricane. They stomped it, and it just splattered, and then it was just pieces. Uh, yeah, your animations are... They, when people look at your animations, they cannot help but, but understand that what you're telling them is the truth. There's no other way to interpret them, and they're staggering. But look at this. This is, this is again off Western Africa where hurricanes are, are formed and born and then literally shepherded right across the Atlantic all the way and then cranked up. Their intensification is, is given the green light at the end and then they're brought to shore. Go ahead. What you're stating about the Hawaii hurricane, Jeff, was exactly right. I mean, that's a good uh, visual analogy, stomping it out, because that's more or less what happens when you, when you, heat the ionosphere above that storm and you get a downburst of pressure and you can see that downburst ring expand out exactly like you describe it is in a sense stopping it out just exactly what you described so they absolutely can and are making or breaking hurricanes wherever they choose we had a 12-year a major hurricane drought um, sandy was not a major hurricane by the way even though it did major damage and then when they chose to allow the impacts again, and I'm sure because multiple countries around the globe are all participating, all the major powers are colluding and cooperating on these programs, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps some of those other leaders weren't that happy that the U.S. was ex exempting itself from some of the impacts. But I would argue we're at the point now where certainly we, we know that the U.S. government is not concerned about the American population. They never have been. Nah. Uh, we're we're simply cannon fodder for them, as we know. And, and the, the more the population now is mired in misery and struggle, the less they're able to focus on the wider horizon. And this we can say for certain, though. Whatever your listeners want to conclude about agendas of the U.S. government and the motives behind these programs, what we can say with absolute certainty is what we are describing. The manipulation of cyclones into, into scenarios that do horrific damage is absolutely positively occurring. We can speculate on the agendas. But the fact that this is going on is beyond debate. Beyond, uh, completely. So if you head over to Rents, 
Scroll down to headlines, look over in the right column, you'll see a big orange red uh, hurricane. It's right there, Hurricane Lane. Just if you have a few minutes, look at that, and you'll see exactly what Dane just said, what I said. This hurricane was going to do damage to the military installations on Oahu, and they couldn't have that. They didn't want it, so they stopped Lane right south of Oahu and just squashed it. They, they might as well have stepped on it, and, and you'll see it. As clear as day. Uh, also, at the bottom of that story is a link I put up to a number of North Pacific weather fronts that came across, right, from Kamchatka, where they usually do, and they would move across from west to east, and they came toward the, uh, the coast of the British Columbia area, Washington, Oregon, and you could watch them come across. Sometimes they'd head south a little bit on the jet stream. Beautiful anticyclonic movements, just real pretty weather systems. And you could watch them all be stopped and broken up. Uh, I've got that link in there too. Dane has a hundred times more than I'll ever have. But I just want you to know that this information is there for you. Uh, and if you don't access it, uh, then all of our work is, is, is in vain. So 32 million visits will tell you that people seeing these things were stunned. And that's why it had to go away. Um, so we've looked at the first two pictures. And I, you know, Todd, I'm going to go through this break. I want to make sure we get this. This is so important. And I know our sponsors will understand. Uh, the next picture it is going to just literally, if your jaw doesn't drop, you're, you're not human. This is a geoengineeringwatch.org satellite picture from NASA. Now look at California. This is off the California coast. Look at the San Francisco Bay. It's right there dead center. And look to the left. And what do you see? What do you see? This looks like science fiction. This is not a weather system. This is a joke. I've never seen one this more blatant, more obvious. It, it, it could not have been drawn by a human being any more distinctly than this. This is, this is ridiculous. This is a profound shot, and we have multiple transmission overlap. If you see just about, uh, above the... Actually, south of San Francisco Bay, above San Mateo, you, you see yeah. some configuration of a transmitter. Um, on, on further north, you have a second transmitter there. You have a number of them along the California coast. And we think we've, you know, we, we've located the transmitter sites. Certainly, we know where they are. Uh, and below Eureka is one of the primary sites that we record repeatedly because that site is used commonly as the precipitation is allowed to flow over the state, uh -huh. it is it is blown apart with that transmitter. Why would they do that, people ask. Now, again, when we uh, see the moisture that's not coming down in California, and even though some of the, like in uh, the precipitation from last year, we had some of the valley areas recorded decent precipitation, but the orographic enhancement, the uh, to topographically enhanced rainfall is not occurring. For example, in in my area, the mountains just uh, east and north of me get three times plus, three to four times the precipitation that Redding gets normally. So if Redding gets 33 inches, some of these areas up here would get 100 to 120. That is not occurring. So statistically, they're trying to mask the fact they are migrating much of the rain that should have fallen in California. They're migrating it further east. Why would they do that? And they can do that with these transmitters. They expand. Okay, remember the expanding, repelling force I described with the transmissions. Mm -hmm. So as you saturate that air mass with too many condensation nuclei, too many small particles, the droplets can't combine. They adhere to those particles, so they don't combine to form big enough drops to fall. So as the Oh, that's, that's foul. Let me think about this. Too many particulates, nuclei, too many raindrop nuclei, and Correct. so you have, you have um, not raindrops, you end up with what I've been seeing up here for the last day, day and a half, you have a heavy mist rain. Yes. They're not yes. drops. It, makes, yes. it doesn't even make the damn ground wet. It makes it moist. This is not yes. rain. Too many nuclei. 
Remember, a raindrop, let's just say a piece of dust in the old days, a raindrop would form around a piece of dust and plop to the ground. Now they've sprayed so much crap up in there, the number of nuclei is uncountable, and the moisture will aggregate around the little tiny, uh, these are almost nano-sized probably, uh, oh, particulates. There you go. Go ahead, that, Dave. Tell me. That's another part of the equation, though. It's important. To, you can follow through, but that's another important part of the equation. These particulates are unnaturally small. Yes. 20 to 50 nanometer range. So this is creating the effect you describe. And people can see this even as it, if, if there's enough moisture and it starts to precipitate, you can tell when it's seeded in most instances because you'll see a very rapid fire uniform drizzle. And not the varied droplet sizes you would normally see. Most people have even forgotten what a normal precipitation A normal rain looks like. like. Oh, you remember your windshield Correct. when you were kids? Come on. Big drops, little drops, yeah. uh, all kinds of yeah. drops. Big plop, plop. You'd hear them. Now, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm ashamed to watch this, this, this horrible man-made catastrophe. Uh, it makes me sick. The ground, I dug a hole two weeks ago. Uh, this is after we had a little bit of actual rain, although it was, something was not right about it. It's all screwed up. Anyway, the ground, Dane, was actually moist for about, I want to say an inch, but I might be giving too much. It was, and I dug down with a shovel, and after an inch, maybe inch and a half at the most, it was dry as a bone. Our rainy season should have started last September. September, October, we're supposed to get fronts in here. November, December, nothing, 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 nothing. January, first half of January, nothing. What do we have today? We had rain. The, we the local weather casters will call it rain. It wasn't rain. It was a mist that somehow managed to fall to the ground. It's an obscenity. It's outrageous. I've got a little pond here and there, and the drops in the pond... They look like little teeny tiny specks hitting the water. That's what they look like. That's what they are. It is what they are. And, and what's important to understand is how fast everything dries out afterward. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Very quickly. And these particulates are desiccants. So they are. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why, why are they desiccating? Why? What is it? Is it part of the barium, the aluminum, the, the strontium? What is it in the particulates that's a desiccator? So we know? we know that we know that aluminum is how often or for how long was that used in deodorants for exactly that purpose? Correct. So to absorb and accrete this moisture. Now we know also, Jeff, you 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 felt I'm sure if you're outside the unnatural cool downs that occur when some of this moisture comes over. It's like somebody opened a refrigerator door and you and it, that's it goes right. Through, from balmy to, to this unnatural yeah. sort of chill. So they are using patented processes of chemical ice nucleation. There are very elements, uh, various elements that are used for this. These are endothermic reacting materials. That's an energy absorbing material, and that also has a desiccant effect. So huh. in doing so, they can lower the temperature on the ground, but that dries up much of the moisture. Now, some of the snow that we do see falling when they really nucleate heavily, and again, these are patented processes. We have some of those patents posted at geoengineeringwatch.org. If they search geoengineeringwatch.org, ice nucleating patent, they can find uh, one stunning example. Mm -hmm. But the snow that we're seeing in places, and we've observed this for many years and monitored it, but it, it tends to sublimate. It tends to convert from a solid to a gas without leaving much liquid, much like dry ice would do. So well this said. Is, this is, exactly. You, you, anybody yeah. who's observed this is seeing it, and we'll see this snow sit around at temperatures far above freezing. Yeah. Just like we, well, like we see the ice balls on Lake Michigan, uh, we just had a massive ice disk in Maine. You, your listeners should look this up. Look up Maine ice disk. It's 90 meters wide, a perfect sphere. Completely historically unprecedented, and we have the. It's in it's in a it's in a lake or a river. I forget it's, which. It's in a river. Okay. But again, this is from chemical nucleating elements that uh -huh. are forming these types of phenomenon that have historically never been seen. The ice balls in Lake Michigan forming at temperatures right. pushing 45 degrees. So the bottom line is, we have so much in academia, so many in academia, doing nothing but covering the tracks of the climate engineers lying to a degree that can scarcely be comprehended to try to pacify the population and make them think that the completely unnatural and chemically engineered is natural. 
All right. Uh, look at that. Look at picture number three again. Take another look at that. These are up there for you. Share them with your friends if they don't believe it. When you say the weather's being controlled and they laugh at you, show them these pictures. If they're not honest enough to say, uh-uh, something wrong there, then don't waste any more time with them. All right. Picture number four off Africa's west coast. Another one. Look at that. These don't look like weather systems. They look like some kind of, I don't want to credit them too much, but some kind of an artistic expression. Look at the, look at the right angles. Look at the straight lines. Look at this absurd ribbing in places. It, it's nuts. Nuts. The overlapping transmission sources can be readily seen in this image as well, uh, especially on the, on the lower end of the image. You can see overlapping. Uh, oh, yeah. Look transmission at, ripples. Those are from separate transmission sites that are scattered. Look at the that one coast. that looks like a, a circle there at the bottom. It looks right. almost like a circle. And it's look how it's cut off on the right side. It's like somebody took a knife or an eraser and just erased it. Oh. You, yeah. you won't see this on any uh, mainstream channels. And I, again, this is where we have the climate uh, science community that has, a, has a, for your listeners so they know this, the Nations Weathermen, National Weather Service, and NOAA have an illegal federal gag order on them right now. Uh -huh. uh, they're uh -huh. making every effort to silence this issue. The the local meteorologist, Jeff, we had situations like the head modeling meteorologist at the Weather Channel. This is going back two years, I believe. He was suicided in the Weather Channel carport, accelerated his car to terminal velocity right into the side of a concrete wall. Now, those who knew him and his family said no chance. No I chance remember that. Done this. I remember. So, was that a shot across everybody's bow? Was it? And and we had four, excuse me, 2015, we had, I believe, four prominent Arctic scientists that were the type to speak out. All died anomalous, anomalously. Yeah. Within a short period of time, we had the world's most recognized polar scientist, Peter Wedham, state on the record he felt they were taken out, in his words. Somebody clearly rattled his cage. He recanted two weeks later. But Peter, is this hey, Peter Wadhams? Yes, Peter Wadhams. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, he was on the program here six weeks ago. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Well, That's his okay. his Arctic weather, and uh, he's a brilliant man. And yeah, he is. He is. But I would argue that Peter is not at liberty to speak. No. Freely. No. Not, he not on this. He's issue at, at the, all. the senior years of his life and his productivity, and he he doesn't want any trouble. No. Uh, he, he doesn't, but he is certainly the horse's mouth uh, regarding the polar ice scenario. Now, um, what we hope is that the polar scientists can band together in large enough numbers to stand up and admit that climate engineering is going on. And not only is it not mitigating anything, it's making everything far worse, not better. And that shouldn't be a surprise when you throw this big of a wrench into Earth's natural systems. You can only yeah. get a horrifically bad result. Quick question. Did yes, they go too far, and is the whole weather on the planet now broken? Did the they break answers, it? The short answer is yes. Now, at, at this point, we can consider nothing natural in regard to weather, <laughs> even if there's not an aerosol operation going on above your head. Oh, you man. The planet as a whole. This is why we have a, a nearly 800-page Senate document that I found uh, on an archival site, the the some of the key, because it's so long, we don't expect everybody to go through the whole thing, but we have uh, isolated and highlighted key passages, uh -huh. such as uh -huh. everyone involved in these programs is to have blanket legal immunity. Another passage that normally opposing or adversarial countries will cooperate on this issue because of the cross-border ramifications. Now, back to your question of any natural weather. You can't just geoengineer over your country. You would affect the entire world, and, and all these power centers know that. Right. So they've all colluded and cooperated and worked together on these programs for their own purposes. This is not about the greater good. It's about weather warfare. It's about masking the true severity of biosphere collapse from the population as long as possible but the, but you know and there are other aspects certainly we, it's hard to argue when they know how toxic this is how much this affects our cognitive ability our ability mm -hmm. to think clearly and that's a statistical fact all of that serves the power structure so i would argue there are many many layers to this issue uh, we need to remember that yeah I, I want all of you to understand too that what you're seeing uh basically is coming down from above okay it's it, it, these tremendous amounts of energy are pumped up and they come down 
They up and they down. Uh, okay. Uh, you got news today. We've talked on this program for a long time about the bug and bird decline uh, to the point where they have silent forests now in British Columbia and in the Northwest. And all summer long here from my location, right outside my bedroom at home, I could go out at night and I would not hear one solitary cricket. None. Zero. Gone. Gone. What do you know? You, oh, it's, uh, there was nothing but silence out there. It was crazy. It used to be there were so many crickets, they'd keep you awake. The symphony of noise was that beautiful and that loud. It's gone now. Now, what did you hear? You just got some news from uh, Costa Rica. Can you share that? Yeah, the, the scientist in question. Uh, that I don't did need the study, names. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. That name is published. Um, and some mainstream sources are starting to cover this now. But the latest study released from Costa Rica 98% terrestrial insect collapse. Now, as we know with the monarch butterfly, we just got a study a week ago that the uh, 97% collapse of the monarch butterfly. 97% gone. They're gone. It's worse, though. It's worse. No. Oh. 86 in the last year 86 percent of the remaining three percent collapsed so we're talking about a small fraction of one percent that's left almost nothing so we had a 97 percent collapse up until 2018 now 2018 we've had an 86 percent collapse of the remaining three percent does that make sense oh yeah makes perfect Not sense good. Not no, good. it's so, it's it's worse than that. It's worse. It's this is all. Uh, these are international crimes against nature, of the highest now, order. Uh, this is the important part with the insect collapse. It, although we have academia either claiming one, they have no idea what's going on, clearly <laughs> not true, or two, they blame these collapses on climate change alone. Now, I'm I'm not denying anthropogenic climate damage to the planet. Not at all. We have full sections on that at geoengineeringwatch.org, but there can be no legitimate discussion about the climate or the state of the climate without talking about climate engineering first and foremost. And in the case of the wildfires, we can hang that scientifically almost completely around the neck of climate engineering. Again, that is not to deny anthropogenic warming, but climate engineering, the mm -hmm. bigger factor in the fires and the insects, because there is this bioavailable, bioaccumulative, toxic heavy metals and polymers raining down from the sky. The climate engineers would have us believe that when they, when they do what they're proposing, they're saying is only a proposal which has been going on for 70 years, that these particles sprayed into the stratosphere, and they're spraying them into the troposphere, by the way, not the stratosphere, that this will stay aloft for two years. That's a blatant, glaring lie. These materials come down very quickly. Polymer chemists that we work with at geoengineeringwatch.org, now deceased, calculated 12 to 24 hour descent times in many cases. That is very quickly descending to the ground where we get to breathe it and inhale it. So for the insects exposed to all this and exposed to the massive UV radiation that's bombarding all of us now, and by the way, we're working with uh, scientists from South America now that are recording UV radiation in the Andes comparable to the surface of Mars. And that would be, if we, if we look at a max reading here of 15, which is a fictitious reading, but that's our max reading, mm -hmm. this would be Com comparable to a reading of 45. That's what they're getting on the surface. So all wow. of this killing insects, yeah. all of it related to climate engineering. Uh, again, if for those in your audience, Jeff, and I know we face many challenges, many, but must we not focus on the biggest hole in the bottom of the boat first if we expect to stay afloat much longer? Right, well said. Perfect. If you scroll down on the uh, right-hand side uh, under Featured Stories at Rents, you'll come up with Fukushima nuclear catastrophe. The top story in there, I leave in this position, people all over the country have been sending me emails about their interpretation, their observations of bugs and birds. All right, it says updates. No bugs, no birds, as we've warned. Extinction is here. Please contribute your observations. So if you want to send anything, fine. I know it's winter. Uh, you can wait till summer if you want, but don't forget, go read these accounts. Yes, there are pockets where there are still normal insect populations, but they're rapidly diminishing. And the tide pools, gone from British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, down into California. 
many tide pools gone. You've seen the videos from Monterey, nothing but water and rocks. No seed. They're usually 6,500 plus different organisms occupying tide pool zones. These are environmental zones, very special, very intricate, very sophisticated. There's nothing left of them. They're gone. And it works all the way down into California, into Baja, and now we get the report. 90, what was it? 97% in, of the insects have imploded in Costa Rica? Costa Rica's 98%. 98? Yes, Look, this is an e- extinction-level event, ladies and gentlemen. We're not joking. It's not just on the West Coast. Go read the updates. No bugs, no birds under the Fukushima nuclear catastrophe. And understand that this is part and parcel of geoengineering and radiation. It's all the same in the end. We're losing links in the chain of life that will never be reconstructed. It's not going to happen. Well, this is... This is where people I know understandably struggle. I mean, when we face challenges of this magnitude, many feel paralyzed and don't know what to do. And I, I hope that that condition could be changed because if if we can collectively expose climate engineering, I have argued many times, we'll continue to argue, we would cause a shockwave around the globe. We would unite populations in a common cause. We would expose those in power and what they have done to all of us without our knowledge or our consent. We could change the flavor of what we face. We will never know the planet we have known. That's a given. We are past the point of any return to the planet we have known. But if we could yet salvage any part of Earth's life support systems, is that not worth fighting for? It is worth fighting for. It's our obligation. How do we do that effectively? Going out in the street and pointing at the sky, I use this example often because it's 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 a clear image, and, and ranting, that does not wake people up. It tends to shut them down. Passing on, as you read at the beginning of my post on this, Jeff, with the picture, how much more effective a picture is at exposing an unpleasant and dire truth, and especially when it's accompanied with data, hard That's data. Staggering, these pictures. Staggering. So... So that's much more effective at waking people up that don't want to wake up than just pointing at the right. sky and ranting, correct? So if we try to provide a geoengineeringwatch.org, and we, on our homepage, we have links to our 20-page fact and photo summary booklet. And I think, Jeff, I think I've sent you those in the Oh, past. I've given them out. I've got them. I've, right now, I have them in the car still. Uh, the beautiful flyers that you made, the booklet, yeah. Wonderful. So, so we have the links for those that you can share for your own, from your own home computer for, without spending a penny. I mean, passing on that twenty-page PDF link can be very effective. So, so oh, pass stunning. on that kind of data, yeah. and and that way you can do it from your home computer. You can do an immense amount of good. Find groups, organizations, and individuals that would care if they only knew. Anybody that wants hard materials, we print them in mass quantities and and and. Provide them for our approximate cost of producing and shipping just to get them in circulation. We've, we've gotten about right. 100,000 booklets in circulation, over a million flyers. Congratulations. So good. If, good, if good. you just share that, even the links, though, from your home computer without spending a penny, people can do so much good for this cause, Jeff. I am heartsick to think that I will, and I, when they first put on television weather satellite photos of the northwest and northeastern Pacific and you could watch the storms form up off Kamchatka yes. and move across one after the other, like a big crescent moon, a big crescent of moisture, these beautiful weather systems spinning uh, anticyclonically, right? Counterclockwise, all right? No, cyclone is yeah. counterclockwise. Anyway, they In would, the mo- yeah. they would yes. march across the Pacific one every two or three days, and all winter long, you'd say, oh, I'm going to go look. And you'd see the next storm. You'd say, ah, that storm will be here the day after tomorrow or two days after tomorrow. And they'd come across beautiful formations. What do we get now? It looks like stuff that's been run over by a car. Big pieces of chaos moving across in these clots of moisture, which are so overly nucleated now with little tiny nanotech-sized particulates that when they do hit the West Coast, they don't rain. They mist. We've had two days of mist here now, and it's it's such an, a disgusting thing. The lake near me is is uh, low as I've ever seen it. It's just it's and and I'm not alone. This is happening all over the place. 
We are being shut out of the moisture. People say, well, what about the Midwest? All the snow, all the rain, all that on the East. Yeah, they're getting bombed. We understand that. But the West has been shut out again of the moisture procession. We don't get it. If I, if I could elaborate on that, because that's a very important, important point that, again, it's covered under the engineering winter section at geoengineeringwatch.org. The fact that there has been a, a very concerted focus on the eastern half of the United States, lower 48. Why? Because that's the most populated zone. If you can continue to engineer cool downs over that area, you continue to confuse and divide the population as to the true state of climate collapse. That's exactly what they're doing. So let's exactly what you said, Jeff, in an overall context. What do we have globally in regarding atmospheric RH, atmospheric relative humidity? It has dropped since 1945 when these programs were first fully deployed. The laws of physics state clearly you cannot have less atmospheric RH relative humidity on a warming planet. Atmosphere holds 7% more moisture for every degree C of warming. We should be getting much more overall global yes, rainfall, yes, and we are not. Yeah. So for those that are getting deluged, that is not a snapshot of the entire world. We have protracted drought in every continent because they are, again, when you, when you co cover the sky with these particles, not only is there too many condensation nuclei, but you affect convection. So now you have not only a, a, a scientific condition called global dimming from the block sunlight, you have global stilling. That's a science term. There is less overall wind on the planet, which further reduces evaporation. Wind is a core part of evaporation, as is direct sunlight. So climate engineering, again, from every conceivable direction, including the nuclear element, climate engineering is the single greatest factor with ozone destruction. Not denying the other factors, but climate engineering is the greatest. So now what happens when we have another large CME, coronal mass ejection or solar flare, yeah, yeah, and, we have, yeah. and we have, you, you know where I'm going with this, oh, Jeff, yeah. we have, and we have grids shut down around the globe, we're going to have Fukushima times several hundred. And we're, geoengineering we're in, is the core of that, too. We are in such, such trouble, and it's so sad to think that uh, in our lifetimes, we'll never see it as it was again. The weather has been broken. All right. There's not one good thing that those, excuse me, I almost said a bad word. Those scientists, and that's a bad word because I, I don't think people not serving the common good should be called scientists. Those people are absolutely destroying our planet. What good thing can they claim that they have done with geoengineering? Nothing. What? Nothing. Nothing. And as bad as it is, as bad as the picture is that we are painting, if there's a quantum leap we could take in the right direction, all of us collectively, if we could, if we could get this issue to the light of day, if we could expose it, we could stop it. If we could stop it and allow nature to respond on her own to the damage done, I would argue that is the greatest chance we have to at least at minimum buy time it would have at to stop immediately all of it stop shut yes. them down but what are they yes. doing they're building more they're portable they're, they can move them with trucks they can put them on boats they can move these stations anywhere uh, and start pumping up all they need is a place to plug it in but if we can reach a critical mass of awareness and the families of all those involved with this insanity understand that their own family member is is literally we're killing the planet your family member is involved with killing the planet now maybe this is part and parcel of the georgia guidestones are going to reduce the world population by 90 percent maybe that's what they're doing here i don't think they need to do this to do that though there's many other ways that they could do it but please look at the rest of these pictures and and dane if you want just pull the pictures over they're enlarged for you use them any way you want uh, these images show you what is being done to weather systems and this is a worldwide problem and it's getting only worse look at the lines look at the energetic signatures in there if that doesn't scare you nothing will listen madness it is madness it is madness but i i would argue jeff that if we have any chance of salvaging some part of earth's life support systems we must try and we do have that opportunity if we do it effectively and efficiently we're running out of time, uh, friends, and I mean it. We are running out of time. It's that bad. Dane, uh, be safe. Uh, I don't even like, I remember when they killed that weatherman. I knew it wasn't a suicide. Uh, there, All those weather people are living under the same awareness. They better not talk about this. Real simple. So they don't. It's up to you. Send them some pictures. See if they'll even answer you. That'd be fun. 
lot of them have their email address for their local weather station. Send them some of these pictures. Say, what the hell am I looking at here? See, see if they even answer you. Dane, Thanks, you be well. Take care. I'm here anytime. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, good night. Dane Wigington, geoengineeringwatch.org. Just an incredible repository of, of brilliant research, uh, essential research. They, and you know who they are, they are killing the planet. Back tomorrow. Take care.